Hello everyone and welcome back to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're continuing Unit 2 and today we're going to discuss population policies. Now when referring to population policies, these are typically going to be some sort of law or legislation or dictate that has been handed down by the government or the state. Uh, and of course it's going to be in regard to population. Uh, whether the government is trying to somehow curb population growth or trying to sustain population growth or maybe trying to really grow the population itself it's going to be something that the government is trying to do in order to control the population of that particular country most of the time the government is looking to try and solve some sort of perceived problem whether it's an actual problem a problem they think they have or maybe they look into the future and they see a particular problem and a lot of times that's is going to be more about the future because of course uh, with population there's really nothing you can do about population right now it's only things that you can do down the road whether it's to encourage or discourage people from from having children so we're talking about the popul po uh, the problems of either overpopulation or underpopulation of course if you remember from our conversation earlier in the unit overpopulation is simply when a population has outpaced its carrying capacity uh, so the ability to sustain itself, whether it's uh, through the through the economy or through the natural resources that are available, whatever. Underpopulation is really a different uh, different problem, and this is the problem that some European countries might be facing. They're talking about Japan potentially facing in the future, and it really has more to do with the fact that since the population is shrinking, uh, the government is going to have a hard time sustaining the country because. Mainly you have uh, lack of workforce and you also have lack of taxpayers who are going to be paying into the, to the government to support certain services. And really these are going to be all kinds of government services. Uh, and, then, and then of course uh, since the tax money is coming, not coming in, the government is not going to be able to provide uh, not just uh, the typical government services, things like uh, maybe, maybe the army or the navy or um, other uh, other forms of protection or, or uh, infrastructure but a lot of times also the different types of social services that governments uh, in our particular day uh, like to provide uh, towards the poor towards the elderly uh, and so that's really what underpopulation is uh, about and remember we talked about this concept of um, the concept of dependency ratio so when your dependency ratio gets too high you might run into this issue of, of your underpopulation and you also see situations where the government does this in order to increase the status of the state. Somehow the government or the whoever is in charge, the leader a lot of times maybe a dictator of some kind, is trying to increase the prominence of that particular state. And a lot of this is, is tied to uh, very high ideals of nationalism, which are, which are a lot of times tied into a uh, particular race or ethnicity. We've seen this much more historically than we have seen it recently, but again, a lot of times they'll, they will speak to the emotions and the nationalistic uh, tendencies of people uh, to try and rally them to some sort of uh, some sort of action towards either. And a lot of times, this has to do with growing the population as opposed to uh, to curbing the population. When we talk about population policies, there are two types of population policies, you see them down there at the bottom, those are what are called pronatalist and antinatalist. So when we talk about pronatalist and antinatalist policies, uh, you know, think about your literature class, look at your prefixes. Uh, pronatalist is simply going to uh, be things that incur, there are different policies that the government puts in place uh, that would encourage people to have more children so that they would have larger families. And so, of course, the idea there is they're trying to, some, for some reason, and we'll talk more about this in just a second, to increase the population. They want more people to have more children so they can increase the population. And antinatalist, of course, is the exact opposite. For some reason, they're trying to curb the population growth, so they're trying to encourage people, or in some cases, force people to have fewer children. So let's talk specifically about them. So pronatalist policies. Uh, what are they? Historically, what we've seen with pronatalist policies is you have governments or dictators or um, or some sort of strongman in the state uh, who's trying to achieve some sort of state goal. Uh, one of the one of the examples that comes directly to mind is Adolf Hitler during World War II or Stalin uh, in Soviet Union. You have the situation where the the state is trying to achieve a particular goal. In Hitler's case, he was trying to conquer 
more territory in Europe. He wanted to take over Europe and potentially take over the world. So he needed to grow the German population. It had been depleted after World War I, so he's trying to grow the German population so that not only can he get the economy running, but also so that he can then go infiltrate uh, other countries around Europe and try, uh, and try and take over those particular territories. Uh, in, in the Soviet Union, it was more about trying to meet some sort of economic objective. Uh, Stalin implemented the five-year plans to try and grow the economy, especially in, in, in the industrial sector, and he needed more workers, because just like Germany, the Soviet Union or Russia had been depleted in terms of its population uh, as a result of World War I and really World War II. Uh, so he tries to, he really tries to encourage uh, people to have more children. And a lot of, and, and in both of these cases, both Hitler and Stalin appealed to the nationalism of the people in their countries, and they, it's, a, it's about having children for the fatherland. It's about having children for the country or for the good of the country. It's not necessarily so that you can enjoy your family. It's not necessarily so that you can have a healthy heritage and all these other types of things. It's about doing it for the state, doing it for the Communist Party, doing it for, for Germany so that your country can see uh, success or win a war or fight the enemy or make more money or whatever it happens to be. So that's a really a lot a lot of what we've seen historically. Uh, if we look at it more recently, if we look at it more recently, what we've seen is we've seen this an effort by countries to try and somehow curb population decline. Uh, and you see this again a lot. Uh, you see it in, in parts of Western Europe. You've seen it in Russia. You see it uh, currently happening in Japan, where especially the native population is is in a little bit of decline. And we talked about that in the demographic transition model, so I'm not necessarily going to go back to that. Um, but the problem is, is that you have a decline of the population. So just like I was talking about with underpopulation, you need more people in order to sustain the viability of the government. You need more people in order to sustain the economy. And it, and it is, it's not just about tax situation, tax revenue, but it's also about the jobs that are available in the country. Again, once the elderly uh, retire and, and those types of things, you need more people to fulfill those jobs. Well, if there are enough people to fulfill the jobs, and you know the company is either going to go out of business or it's going to have to move or something like that. Um, there's also situations, especially you see this in Europe, uh, where you seem to have some cultural tension. Uh, the people are very concerned about maintaining their native population because of the concern that their native population will be overtaken by minority populations, especially coming, and this is in Europe, especially coming from Northern Africa and Southwest Asia. The situation where, um, because they are representative democracies with their parliaments, because you have these new groups of people coming in, uh, they are, of course, going to be a voting in and electing people that represent their particular viewpoints or their particular interests. And so the concern is, is that as those minority populations grow, they might end up becoming the majority because the people have actually uh, birthed themselves out of, uh, out of representation because of their very low birth rates. And so it's this huge concern, and, and it's kind of coupled with the European Union and, and bringing all these European countries together that they, they will almost lose their ethnic or their cultural identity. And so there's real concern for those kinds of types of things. And so governments are beginning to encourage people to have more children uh, because of those, those particular situations. Now, when we look at pronatalist policies, what are they? they don't, they're not always necessarily something that is incredibly obvious. Uh, some things that are incredibly obvious are like the cash rewards or prizes that you might get in order for having children. I've heard of contests in, uh, in Russia where if you have a child on a certain day, um, then you receive a, a cash prize. Uh, there's I've heard about uh, certain countries uh, giving uh, their workers a holiday so that uh, they can try and encourage people to have children, things along those lines. So those are, are very obvious, uh, very obvious things that we would consider to be pronatalists because they're actively encouraging people to have children. Other things that maybe aren't as obvious to us would be things like tax incentives. Uh, we, we have this here in the United States. Uh, you either get some sort of tax credit uh, for having uh, for uh, for the ch uh, for the number of children that you have in your family, or you might get a tax deduction because you have spent money on things like childcare or schooling or you know what other things related to having children. And so 
obviously the only way you can have access to those things is if you have children themselves and so uh, these particular tax incentives don't necessarily they're not as obvious to us uh, but those would be considered pronatalist policies because they wouldn't necessarily encourage people to have children but a lot of the fears that people have about having children especially when it comes to their cost and expense it helps to kind of uh, do away with those fears because they know that uh, they will be able to take advantage of those types of things. Um, another thing that I've seen uh, here recently, this was put out by the, um, this was put out by an international, uh, the Population Reference Bureau, who was put out by, I was talking about Germany and how uh, the German government uh, was was making efforts to try and pay people, uh, pay families who were having to pay for childcare. So the government, it's not just a tax break or a tax credit or a tax deduction. It's actually the government paying for child care or, uh, you know, it, for a certain number of days or whatever. Uh, so, again, trying to trying to take care of some of those things that might make children more costly. So, again, it's just going to depend on which country you look at around the world uh, in terms of what policies they might be uh, taking, uh, putting, into, uh, putting into place. Now we'll move on to the antinatalist policies. Of course, as you can imagine, the antinatalist policy is the whole situation there is if you have a problem of potential overpopulation where you cannot sustain the population growth of your particular country. Uh, so what's going to happen is, is, again, the government is concerned that uh, there's not going to be enough resources, economic resources, jobs that are available, uh, um, natural resources in terms of food, uh, energy, water, those types of things. And so they try to plan ahead of time uh, to try and curb back the population growth so they're really just not able to meet the demands of the growth uh, and you see this mostly in countries where you had some sort of planned or controlled economy uh, because of some of the policies put in place by the government in terms of planning or trying to control the economy um, as they tried to control the economy uh, they had very rapid population growth and so the planned economy wasn't meeting the population growth and so as a result they ended up having to try and control the population. Really you've only seen uh, antinatalist policies really actively uh, pursued in situations like China and India. Of course China and India are the world's two largest populations and really India and China took two different routes. Of course I think uh, the most famous is the one-child policy uh, for China and, and I'm sure we've all heard of it where people are only allowed to have one child um, you know, there are varying reports on what happens if a family has more than one child. Um, a lot of it, especially today, a lot of what happens is if you have multiple children, uh, the government restricts some of your, uh, your, your freedoms or rights, not necessarily freedoms or rights, but what you're, you're allowed to do. Uh, the government can restrict areas where you're allowed to live. Uh, they might, you know, if you had a, if you were living in the city and working in a job, they might uh, kick you out of the city, especially if you move from one from where you were born and originally living to a new city. They might kick you out. They might not. They might not pay for your child's education, especially like a secondary education of some kind. Um, and so uh, that's the Chinese route. It was much more forceful, uh, and of course that had a lot to do with Mao Zedong and his uh, and his uh, his vision for China in, in terms of uh, the planned economy that he had. The Cultural Revolution and those types of things. Um, the other situation we saw in him was India. Now India took a, a little bit different tact and they tried more the education route where they tried to educate their people about jobs and skills and about contraception and those types of things. Um, I'm not necessarily aware of any situation where they tried to force people into having fewer children but simply it was more about uh, getting out information to people and trying to promote jobs and education so it would become more of a natural progression for you to have fewer children. Uh, and so again, those are really the only two times we see antinatalist policies put into place. So that is our conversation on population.